Welcome to the Carp Academy 2011. We've got 30 new students, 15 of the best tutors in the land, and a cracking new venue to boot in Manor Farm Fishing. It's set to be a belter. I can't wait. Well, we're round with Alid Webb, tutored by Pete Castle. Pete, same as last year, mate. First fish straight away before anyone else. Now, I presume you've done your usual bit of magic and got him to sort of sneakily get some rigs in place straight away. Well, tell us the story. That was exactly what I said to him. Keep it nice and simple, get some simple rigs tied up. We can do all the complicated things later in a, in a couple of days, looking at choddies and things like that. Just simple, not let's not rigs. Got them out there. No spotting, no marking. Just see the fish rolling. Got the rods out there and screamed off, didn't it, Adam? Brilliant. Yeah. So what have you learned there about opportune fishing? Um, nice and quick, simple rigs, and just put it where the uh, fish are rolling. Well, there you go. Softly, softly, always does it. Let's just pull this back a bit. Lovely and clear. You see how the, the tip was yeah. was vibrating, yeah. Right, so we'll check the depth now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, plus the, the float's six inches long, stem six inches long, so it's about eight foot. Look, that's not far off of the range of where that fish showing. Oh, that's good. That's good enough for me. That'll, you know, I'd be more than happy with that. So what we do, pull the pull the float down to the bottom, and then on the reel, we just put the line under the clip on the reel. Right, so that's that's clipped up under the reel, yeah? So you can see that, yeah? The rod's at the same angle as where we would finish a cast, yeah? So I'm just gonna pull it back a little bit more just to see. That's just gravel, where you see the tip. That's just lovely and clear out there. It's just what's in Yeah. So we'll do, that, we'll do that depth again, just to see if the depth has changed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So seven plus the flow, eight foot. It's exactly the same depth, but no difference. That's where the fish are showing. That's good enough. Well, here we are with Greg Clark and Connor Barker and Andrew Endine. They're brilliant tutor, and as you can see, they got off to an absolute flyer. You've got them catching early. What have you done? Um, well, we've watched what um, everybody else is doing, sort of spotting and marker floats, and we've just decided to put some single hook baits close in in the margins, and uh, this is, uh, we've had three fish now in quick succession. So, okay, yep. Um, we're going to top it up with a bit of bait later on and hopefully just keep them there for a bit longer for the boys to catch a few more. So I've noticed already, we've seen Pete Castle, he's got the, the kids doing the same thing, just sort of getting a little bit of, uh, you know, stealth into their game, starting carefully, you know, not running in like a bunch of bulldozers. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, just getting them to um, see where the fish were showing and putting a bait on them effectively and uh, it seems to have worked. Brilliant. Well, there you go. As you can see, if you start with a bit of stealth, you can have some lovely opportune captures straight away. One of the beauties of Carp Academy is I get to see people like Mark Bryan and actually pick his brains about his area of expertise, which is bait. And one of the bits I want to talk to you about, Mark, is hook baits, because it's such an important part Absolutely. and a lot of people overlook it, you know? It's Definitely. easy to just throw out a round one, isn't it? It is, yeah, but in my experience, it's making it very easy for the carp to deal with. So okay. with that, you know, the snowman rig, 
Um, anything with buoyancy, you're tipping the favour back in your in your court, in my, in my experience. All right, brilliant. Well, we've got a little menagerie of stuff in front of yep. me. Some of it looks very peculiar, but I'm sure you're going to tell me why it's brilliant. Okay. Like, let's go to the round bait. So this is the standard thing that you see a lot of young anglers cast out, but they can easily turn it around. And uh, we were just having a chat off camera, yep. and you explained to me the importance of buoyancy, tipping yep. something off with a bit of colour and buoyancy. Why, why do you always do that? Well, on a venue like this, which is very predominantly hungry water, we've got a lot of fish here, that little white speck at the top is a great little home. The, the water clarity is not brilliant here, so the little white fleck on the top just gives the fish in the vicinity something to home in on. And also the buoyancy, by tipping the bait upwards, we're making sure our hook is all aligned downwards. And that's very important for hook holds, getting solid hook holds on here. And the fish that the two lads have just caught next to us have got brilliant hook holds on that. And they're yeah. using a little snowman setup. So, you, you know, all sort of, you know, where the position, it, it leaves the hook, it, it negates the weight of the hook, allowing yep. that hook to hang and, and attack the, the bottom of the mouth definitely, when they pick yeah. it up. Definitely, yeah. You hold the hold it by the top, the hook's hanging right down a position to hook the fish. And that's how it behaves in water, isn't it? You know? That's right, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, let's move on to some of these more peculiar setups because you know it's fascinating to look at it now. I've got I know you said to me that you always take paste on the bank with you. Always, you yeah. Know? What, why do you do that? Because you don't see many anglers do it at all, do you? No, you don't, but with two pots of paste, we've got buoyancy and a bottom bait paste. We can make any buoyancy we want. We can make a straight pop-up, we can make a critically balanced bait, we can do everything in between. So to that nature, having pots of paste on the bank there just absolutely lends itself to any session. You so you've got loads of flexibility. So, like, for example, you've got this little one here yeah. where, you know, three quarters paste. Three quarters. Quarter, yeah, yeah. Three, three quarters bot sinking paste with some pop-up paste on the on the top and that just stands up like a little guinness pot and if you're fishing a bag <laughs> it looks like one. it does yeah <laughs> yeah if you're fishing a little bag it just stands up and it's just a bit of fleck of color poking through the top of the pellets and it's neutral buoyancy as well so when the fish sucks up the bag contents it's all up in there everything goes in awesome you now this is one of uh, your favorites it's atlantic heat yeah so full of spice, full of flavour. So does the paste release a lot more attraction than a ball bait? Oh yeah, by, by boiling a bait, you're effectively sealing it. Okay. With the paste, you're not denaturing any of the products in there and it, it dissolves really, really quickly as well. So the paste wraps and it's absolutely exceptional, especially on, say, hungry waters. So when would you use a paste wrap? Would you, are you more likely to use it in the cooler months when obviously, you know, the water doesn't sort of attack the bait as well and doesn't release the flavours as quicker? Uh, yeah, the winter is a great time to use it. I use it all year round. If there's not a big problem with bream and roach and that, the carp will come into a patch and they're homing onto a paste bait much more readily than a boiled bait. I've got barbell anglers, um, Stu Morgan, who's a, who's a friend of mine, he's watched fish on the Bristol Avon. Big bed of boilers, one with a pace wrap, barbels come upstream, straight to that pace wrap, bang. It's the first bait he's took. Every yeah. single, he says it happens countlessly. Honed in, yeah. straight to that, not the feed, straight to the hook bait. Straight to the hook bait. It's following a tray on, that's giving out the strongest scent on the bait. And if you want that in the fishing situation, a pace wrap's always. So I try and do it for all, all my fishing, oh, all around the lead. Awesome, now, we've got these pellets matching your hook baits to, yeah. to the feed. Now, we've got some really peculiar baits that really don't match the freebies, but I want to yeah. talk about matching them. When's the right time to do that? Well, if we're putting out bags and spod mixes and that, um, especially bag fishing, I want everything to be exactly the same. And if I've got the fish feeding on pellets, I want them to pick up a pellet-shaped hook bait. So with and the little bits of paste, you can make a little 12 mil, 10 mil, Four mil, it doesn't Amazing. matter. Amazing. So literally on the bank, you could go, right, I'm going to fish pellets, it's right for the day. Yeah. And you could just roll yourself four or five hook baits, put them in the kettle, like boil them up yep. as you would. Definitely, yeah. And you're fishing. That's it. I've seen countless times when there's been an 18 mil bait in with a like a bag of pellets. Yeah. And the carp are coming in, they've sucked up most of the pellets. It's over there, isn't it? It's fanned out their way. Bang. And that's it. So for me, yeah, matching your hook bait is absolutely crucial. Now, let's talk about not matching. One of the beauties of having a big lump of paste with you is creating morsels like this. Yes, yes. And, and like that, you know, that's a boiled one that you've done, a big stick. Nice and long, yeah. Right. You were telling me about shapes and how you find that barrels and, and oblong shapes like this are actually harder to eject for carp. 
That's right, yeah, we found from, I keep carp, capcock all my life, and at our tank uh, in the unit, we feed them round boilers, um, little barrels, and you see when they're facing you in the tank, if they suck in a round bait, it's, and it's blown out in a split second, in and out, gone. When you feed a barrel or a little stick, it's in their mouth, and they try to spit it out, but you can see it rattle, it goes one side to the other and out. So for me, it's keeping your hook in the fish's mouth for that split second, and that's, for me, percentage-wise, that's gonna hook you more fish. So would you cast something like that? I've actually had a bit of success. I caught my biggest ever carp last year on a bright orange one, this sort of size, wow, yeah. you know, like 20 mil plus. Yeah. And it obviously can't, that was in a monk's bait, you know. Yeah. Would you cast one of these out as a single hook bait? Um, single hook bait I have done on occasion. The water I'm fishing is absolutely bream infested. Yeah. Um, they don't, you know, the, the carp in there are big, they've got big mouths, you know, big as a coffee cup. So there's no problem that you could spin that round in a, in a 20s mouth or a doubles mouth. I've caught plenty of fish, sort of 15 pound on that, that sort of size bait and you can twist it all the way around in the mouths. It's very, very selective. And for myself, when I do overnight fishing, I want, if it goes off, I want it to be a carp. And when you're having nine, 10 bream a night, you just can't yeah, be yeah, dealing yeah. with it. And the other thing is the carp just don't see it. No one's doing it. No one's putting out big baits. Everyone's no. fishing 18s and 15s. And you should be surprised how confident the carp can get on these. If you just keep putting them in, don't need a lot, you only need... It's heavy, it heavy, works yeah. all in your favour, doesn't it? Your rig mechanics get great hook holds, but you don't have to put in much bait, that's the key. Instead of putting 5k of 15s out, which get wiped out overnight by a bream, put a kilo of them in, they're staying there to the carp eat it. So oh, it saves on the pocket as well. Amazing stuff. Well, there you go. Sizes, colour, smells, different textures. It catches this man loads of carp. Well, we've just spoken to Mark Bryant about the importance of hook baits and have a look at this. A new PB for Matthew Halliday. Richard the tutor on hand to give him expert advice. Richard, talk me through exactly how he's caught this carp. Well, um, one look at his swim kind of revealed that there was a the big, big feature was the island out in front. So uh, we didn't look any further than just flicking a little mesh bag of crumbed up uh, new grange about two rod lengths back off the shelf where the, where the seam of gravel meets the silt. Okay. Um, that's topped up with sort of six, uh, six to eight spots of particle. Um, and off she went about sort of, I don't know, an hour after casting. Yeah, it's yeah. getting heavy, eh, Matthew? Yeah. So. Tell me about the hook bakes. I know you've done a little bit of trickery on that to uh, fool this one. Yeah, it's uh, basically a, a halved new grange with a, a sort of a trimmed down uh, white hinders pop up on top. So it just, just settles down and settles on the hook nice with a little bit of a sight blob there to catch their attention. Awesome, awesome. Well, there you go. Precision fishing and a PB to boot. Well, no sooner has Danny Boy here got his rods out, he's done exactly the same as Benedict, walked all the lines out, got it all clipped up nice and tight, put the two rods out with little bags on them, and he's had two bites straight away. Uh, this one weighs seven pounds, not the biggest fish in the lake, but a good start. And what we've basically done while the fish is still in the net, we've, we've actually weighed this to see how much it weighs, zeroed the scales off, so whatever it weighs on the scales is the correct weight. This one's ended up being seven pound, and most importantly, we've taken the fish out of the water in this sling. Most of the damage happens to fish when they're taken out of the water in the landing net, their fins get caught, the line goes too tight, and that's when you can damage them. So by taking them out of the water in the wave sling, you're going to do a lot less damage. Right, now, there we go. Oh, that boy is a lively one. So if you slide your hand down his, down his head and get your fingers around that ball joint there, that's it, so you use that to grip it. Wicked. And just hold him up for everyone to see. Perfect, look at that. And the fish is nice and straight. It's not rolling forwards or back. That is exactly the way to present them. And you're nice and over the mat there. So if it does flip, you can put it down, yep. put the sling back over it. So that is the first of the two, uh, seven pounder. We've got another one to go as well, but it's time for dinner too. So we're gonna try and get these ones back as quickly as possible and get some food down our throats.
Now it's really easy to get caught up in all these little rings, shrink tube bits and pieces, but Mr. Dove over the last few months has sort of revolutionized his fishing with the most simplest of rigs. Now, Dovey, yep. it has actually revolutionized your fishing, isn't it, over the old boilies? You're catching loads, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm catching more than I used to, even more so than I used to on the, on the muzzle, I suppose. Um, it's just as simple as that, and uh, yeah, keeping it simple. What, why do you think it is? Because for all intents and purposes, this rig looks like your standard knotless knot. Yeah. Why is it working so well and how does it work? Um, it is because you're keeping it simple. You put your boilie fishing, so you're, you're concentrating more on where you're putting your bait more than what you're using, your, your, your rig basically. Um, using a nice big hook and, and just keeping the gape, gape nice and open on your rig. Now, so when you're talking about the boilie situation, um, are you talking about a spread of boilies or in a tight cluster? Uh, spread of boilies, always. Yep. Yeah, very, very rarely am I putting it in, well, never am I putting it in a tight cluster like you would do with a spod mix. So that's the first point. If you have a look at the length of that, it's probably about, you know, 10, 12 inches? Yeah, I, at least. I, that's probably the, one of the shorter ones I use, if, yep. I'm, if not longer, really. Um, the reason for that is that sort of to give them enough rope? Um, just because I'm, I'm not generally knowing what I'm casting on, so I'm casting out, making sure I get a drop, and because uh, I might be going to end on a little bit of weed, the longer the hook link, the more chance you've got a good of a presentation. So that, that'll kick away, and even if there's a bit of debris on the bottom, that yeah. will always find somewhere nice to lay on. Exactly. And yeah. I suppose that's why you've got it tipped with, um, with a buoyant bait? Yeah, I've got, I, I'll either fish it like that snowman style with a buoyant bait on top, or I'll drill it out and put a little bit of cork in. Um, it just acts exactly the same way. It's nice and balanced and just sit on top of anything out there. So that, that negates the weight of the hook. And, and, and do, you, do you fish it muzzle style? Um, with the cork drilling it out? No, not, not so much. I don't have so much cork in it. I'm not fishing it as balanced though with, with, with a muzzle. Because so you're, I'm not, not, you're not trying to make the eye sit up? No, it works slightly differently. It's, sort of, it's in between a muzzle basically and a normal standard knot. It's not, so I'm trying to make the bait in between that as well. So it's not really balanced and it's not sinking really fast. It's, it's in between that. Okay, and how do you actually tie the setup? Um, it's just the same like a knotless knot would. I whip all the way up to the point, so on a mixer it's not actually that many turns, probably five or six turns up, in line with the point, pull the hair back and then twice up the shank and then back through. If I'm fishing with a slightly stiffer hook link, I'll fish it with a chod hook instead of a mixer. Because of the outturned eye? Exactly, yes. I'm just trying to create that almost straight, just, just slightly in turn. Yeah, if you, have a, if you have a look at that, folks, that's coming out like that, but you'll see the gape, which is the area between the eye of the hook and the point of the hook, that area there is large. So when you put shrink tube and bits and pieces on, yep. it, it sort of closes the gape up. Obviously you get the sort of turning effect, but with this particular rig, you're actually trying to achieve something different, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the whole flipping turning thing works more if you're fishing on like a small gravel patch and, and the fish are feeding on tight areas and, and you're getting them when they're turning, you know? And hitting the weight of the lead. Exactly, yeah, yep. but I think with this, you've got a longer hook link, um, they're feeding with boilies and they're, they're much more erratic with the way they're feeding and you want a big hook, a big gape, and, and that's a better way of catching them in my eyes. So in effect, you actually can prick the fish when, when the hook link hasn't been straightened, so yeah, it goes yeah, in their mouth and, and they almost lift up to go to the next bait yeah. and they feel that prick and that's when they accelerate. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, some of them I'm hooking that far back in the mouth and that is because I'm using a longer hook link and I'm using um, a wider gape hook. And the balance hook bait, so it's behaving naturally. Exactly, yeah. Well, there you go. A really nice, simple, effective setup that any of you can use back at home. Now, in every school you get a destructive student and I've turned into exactly that because Pete and Ian over here were running a really good <laughs> PVA masterclass and I've come in and uh, made myself busy but what I noticed was the way that they were sort of discarding the slacker funnel web bags and uh, trying to obviously perfect what they're doing. Ian what is it that you're doing while uh, one of the lads charges off for a take? <laughs> well we've uh, we've just finished the solid back section back and uh, we thought we'd just go through the uh, the funnel web type system with right. the guys and uh, as a demonstration have them make, make one up each and uh, go through what was right and what was wrong with them. So you've got the scoreboards out, like judges on come yeah, dancing. We do yeah. have, yeah. We've yeah. Got, we've Where got, are they? Got we've got one. three criteria on You're the it. ugliest judges I've ever seen, <laughs> by the way. But um, what, what, what are they looking to achieve with a funnel web bag? Because, uh, you know, this one's like a wet, saggy dog, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the ideal bag? How, you know, how sort of solid does it need to be? Well, we've, this is where the guys have sort of started, as you demonstrated. It's not quite so, and, and this is the sort of bag they're ending up with. It's like a pepper grinder, this one, isn't it? <laughs> eh? Sprinkles everywhere. And that yeah. one is a bit more as it should be. So that is, is really solid, isn't it? You know, you can't, you can't sort of crumble the bait out of it. No. And, and why do you need it to be that tight? Well, what does it achieve on the bottom? Well, it has more of an exploding effect. Um, 
there's, there's, there's bits of particle in there that will sort of dance about once the bag dissolves and send you know sort of flavour and uh, particles not only just lead on the bottom but they will float to the surface and spread the, the flavour with them. Um, it's a very effective presentation and uh, these guys are with, with, that, with that slacker bag you don't get quite the same the same effect. Again it doesn't cast nowhere near as good as a you know a hard bag. Because that cuts through the air doesn't it? It does, it doesn't, yeah. You get that sort of resistance which can shoot through but this would actually you know do the opposite thing wouldn't it well it's like trying to cast a, a wet sock really isn't it as against yeah. a, i do it regularly a, a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no brilliant and i presume these ground bait mixes are some of your your own from the secret stash yeah yeah we've just brought those out the the uh, the skeleton cupboard just to show the lads what's how, how we fish and what we use and uh, go through the mixes a bit with them show them some some dips and flavors we put we add to them to add to the attraction that adhere very well to the PVA and um, just sort of give them a new dimension to their fishing. That's a massive part of your fishing, Pete, isn't it? The, the PVA Yeah, the stuff. PVA is, yeah. Do you uh, ever cast out without it? No. Always with a bag on? Always with a bag on, yeah. All right, brilliant, boys. I'm and have you, have you learned some? Have you learned the importance of, of what you've seen here, that, you know, the, the importance of a tight bag over a slack one? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, Mr. Whole House, it does look like these boys have uh, learnt about PVA and it's paying off as well. Yeah, believe it or not, Ali, we was just doing a bit of uh, a bit of a talk then on PVA bagging and making PVA sticks, and lo and behold, it's shot off. So yeah, good proof, result. proof, proof in the bags. Oh, proof in the bag, yeah, it does work, mate. Yeah. And and they've really, really understood, you know, that you you two are actually fanatics of the solid bags. Yeah, we have been for a number of years now. <laughs> they're, they're starting to bleed a bit of information out of you, haven't they? You see, we found a weak spot. Yeah. Get children involved and then you have to talk. Is that how you do it? <laughs> I bet you do, don't yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Does it feel like a good one? Yeah. Yeah? Nice, done well. Done well. Nice and steady, steady, steady. Back off it, back oh, off it. Oh, that's a nice one. Lovely. Yeah, leave it. Give it a bit of line, just a bit more line. Just more line. That's more it. Line. Back off it a little bit, that's it. Back off, back off. Give him a bit more line, get that rod up so you can use the rod to bring it back. There we go. Yes! Put it there, young man. <laughs> Wicked. Well, solid bags have won the day for Carl Taylor. You look like a happy fella. Yeah. And they're really, really proving to be a fruitful method for you, aren't they? Yeah. Excellent. Well, we've seen loads of different methods. We've seen PBs, we've seen hook baits, and there's loads more to come in the next episode of Carp Academy. But for now, thank you very much for watching and see you on the bank sometime.